And last or two weeks ago, actually, I told you that this series kind of takes a serious shift, a serious turn. The Gospel of Mark takes a real radical kind of uh, right hand turn uh, a couple weeks ago when we got to the, the part where Jesus told them and, and allowed them to, to understand and know that he is, in fact, the Messiah, that he is the Christ. In fact, Peter spoke up when Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ. And, and so if from that moment forward that the, the gospel of Mark takes a serious turn and it leads Jesus uh, towards the cross. Uh, last week we talked about uh, them getting this identity mixed up, that, that they thought and they recognized rightly so that Jesus is the Christ, but they didn't understand exactly what that meant. They had these expectations about Jesus. They had these expectations about who he would be and what he was going to be about. And it led them to a, a misunderstanding. In fact, uh, Peter pulled Jesus aside because Jesus had just said that the, the Son of Man, that the Christ is going to suffer. Peter pulled him aside and said, no, no, we can't be doing that. You're, you're not going to suffer. And Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. The same guy, Peter, who had just said that you are the Christ, now tells, tells Jesus that you're not going to do these things. And, and, and Peter rebukes him. So all of this stuff, this turn, this change here in the, in the Gospel of Mark, as Jesus heads to the cross, is taking him in that direction. His ministry is now about this, this momentum toward the cross. From this point forward, it's what Jesus is going to be all about. But before he gets to the cross, we get a chance, and he shows us and his disciples a chance to see his radiance. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible with you, feel free to, to grab one of those in the pew in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, feel free to take one of those home today uh, with you as a gift from Snellville Christian Church. We think uh, that the Bible is God's Word and it's so vital for all of us and we want everybody to have access to it. So if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take one of those. I'm going to be reading uh, these first few verses here in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2. <clears throat> And after six days, this is after six days after they had just uh, kind of had this discussion with Jesus about uh, Jesus suffering and about his identity and about how they had these expectations. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not how it's going to be. Mark says after about six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And so for those who are there, this is kind of the inner circle. Peter and James and John and Jesus, they're there. And this is kind of a, a confirmation, so to speak, I guess, a confirmation of what they thought was true about Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah. This is now confirming for them that is absolutely true. Peter, James, and John, they get to now see that Jesus is the Messiah, we see it so clearly that it's almost like Jesus is on fire. He is so radiant. Now, for those of you who are, are, are big time Bible readers or you've been to church for a long time or you remember some of these, you know, you've, you've heard some of these stories. Uh, if you're not, by the way, you should be. This is incredibly compelling stuff. But for those of you who are Bible readers, you're going you're gonna to recognize this. It might be a reminder of what happened about 1,400 years prior when Moses was dealing with, with the law, We're dealing with God and the law. If you remember, Moses had, had kind of brought down the, the, the commandments, the tablets, and kind of the Big Ten, and, and uh, he broke them. So they had to go do it again. He got mad at the people, and he broke the, the Ten Commandments. I wonder how much those things would be worth if we could find them, those broken ones, by the way. It would be pretty, pretty impressive. But that doesn't have anything to do with anything. Uh, so, so they had to go do it again. And so God, is, is, he's on the mountain, and God's giving Moses the law, not just the ten. When we think about the commandments, we think about ten, but there's about 600 or so. And these are kind of not just uh, um, the law itself, but kind of even a, a little bit of an understanding of what, these, what this kind of means and what this looks like. Um, all of Exodus, or not all of Exodus, the, the last part of Exodus um, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, kind of talk about what all of that stuff means. Well, as Moses is on that mountain, he, he's dealing with God and he's trying to figure out and he's getting the law from God because God wanted to be the, the king, the, the leader of the people of Israel. And so Moses is on the mountain and he's, and he's getting this law from God. And, and Moses says, you know, God, I, I think it would be a good idea if you let me see your glory. And this seems like a pretty good, good question. I mean, if you're talking with God, uh, you know, you kind of want to see what, what he looks like. God, I want to I want to see you basically is what Moses asked him. And God said to Moses, look, what you're asking is, is, is not a great question because you can't see me. 
Because if you were to see me, you would die. It's, it's, there's that big a, of a difference between you and me. If you were to see me, you would die. So here, here's, here's the deal. God made a deal with God. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, kind of push you back to where you kind, kind of can't see side to side. And then I'll pass by you and I'll put my hand in front of your face. And as I go past, you'll be able to see my back. Now, you won't be able to see my full glory because that's too much for you. You'll be able to see my back. And so that's exactly what happened. And so as God passed by, he put his hand in front of Moses' face so that Moses couldn't see him. But as he passed by, Moses saw his back. And that was a, a pretty cool thing. He got to see the, 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 the partially, at least, the glory of God. Now, when Moses came down from the mountain, this is where it ties into what we're talking about today. He had no clue, but he comes down from the mountain and he's carrying like a couple extra tablets or, or whatever he's doing. And he's walking down, and he's whistling or however Moses walks, just kind of like whatever kind of thing. And, and the people see Moses and, they, and they freak out because Moses was radiant. Moses was glowing. It's like it's like Moses was on fire because he came into the presence of the glory of God. And so in that moment, and all the way back in Exodus chapter 33 and 34, if you want to read it later, in that moment, Moses was reflecting God's glory. He glowed in radiance because he had been talking to God and been in the presence of God's glory. Now here, uh, all the way fast forwarding about 1400 years or so, 1400, 1500 years, all the way to Mark chapter 9, we see something similar with Jesus on the mountain. Only this time it's a little bit different. This time, Jesus glowed because, not because he was talking to God or because he was reflecting God's glory. No, Jesus shone because he was, he was the glory of God. He is God in the flesh and because now that he is here, he is shining as the glory of God. Hebrews 1.3 writes it like this. He says, he, talking about Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of of his nature. And so Jesus was shining with the glory of God because he is the glory of God. A little bit different than Moses who was simply reflecting it. Now I imagine Peter and James and John and, 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 and the people who were seeing this, they were who were seeing this, Peter, James and John, their, their minds immediately, I'm guessing, their minds immediately went back to their studies as young Jewish boys. Hearing about Moses and the radiance of God, hearing about how Moses uh, shone brightly just as, 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 as having, having had God in him and on him, his presence was there. And so Moses was shining. And I imagine the minds of Peter, James and John remembering that. And now they're seeing that in this, this rabbi, their teacher, their Jesus. And remember what Mark had just talked about. He says this six days prior, they had just talked about the fact that this Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, was going to suffer and die. And they had to be struggling with that, that, that Jesus must die. There were some, some issues there, some tension. How do, we, how do we deal with that? That the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and all of these religious leaders, the ones that, that are supposed to be expecting Jesus and embracing him are, are now going to kill him. And so they're struggling with this idea about suffering for the Christ. And now they see Jesus in, in full glory. The radiance of God. And it's a reminder to them immediately. It's a reminder to them of, of the glory of God here in the presence of Jesus. But not just in that moment, but for, for all time. And they were struggling with, with what's coming about the, the message of, of the Christ suffering and dying. Yet they had this moment where they could see the presence of God and the glory and radiance of God. And I, and I think for us, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in our struggles, to get caught up in our, our issues, to get caught up in the, the things that we have a hard time with. And, and sometimes we, we get so focused on those struggles, like I imagine Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples were worried about suffer, the Christ suffering, that they couldn't see anything else. And I think the same is true for us. I mean, we get caught up in the, the issues of life, what's going on in our life. We get caught up in our financial problems or we get caught up in our relational problems or, or we get caught, especially uh, around the holidays like this. We all have stuff to do. We all have people to see. We have things to, to take care of. Sometimes we, we worry or we struggle with the holiday season because of lost loved ones, whatever it is. It's easy for us to see the issues that, are, that we struggle with that right in front of our face and, and, and see nothing else around us. I, I, I don't, one of the things that I, that I like to do is to try to, try to relate some of this stuff to me personally. 
and, and, I, and I say this, I've said this before, is, is it's, it's hard for me sometimes when we talk about um, suffering and struggling, and I don't mean this as a way to brag, but I have been so blessed. I came from a, a good family. My mom and dad, you know, and I didn't, I didn't come from a broken home. I didn't, you know, I, I've, I've got, a, got a great wife and, a, and great kids who I, I love most of the time. And, it, and my life is, my life is, is pretty good. And, and so when I think about suffering and struggling, I, I, I think back to probably one of the, the, the most difficult times for me was my last few years that I worked at Toyota. For those of you who don't know, I, I say this all the time, but I know some of you probably don't. Um, before I got into doing ministry full time, I, I worked at a factory and I, uh, built cars and at Toyota Motor Manufacturing in Georgetown, Kentucky, and and I I started out just on the assembly line, and I, I worked on the assembly line for uh, about ten years in the same spot pretty much, and it's a kind of a mindless job, and it's just like a like a robot, you know. I could get to where my hands knew what to do, and I didn't have to think about it. It was just one you know one thing after another, and, and people who those of you who have repetitive jobs, you you know what I'm talking about. Uh, well, I had an opportunity to transfer into a special projects, and, and it was ended up being a some, I just wanted something different, so I did it, and it was it was okay. But it ended up being a good thing because I got I got put they they put my special project group into another group. We kind of uh, they just kind of swallowed us basically into this offline repair, which was a which was a highly coveted area where people with with far more seniority than me were trying to get into all the time. And so I got I just got moved there. I mean, it was not because I had enough seniority to get there or anything like that but I got put into this amazing job at, at the end of my time there at Toyota um, simply because I had taken this special project job and they had put it under the leadership of this other leader and I, I was I was fortunate to be there but a lot of people didn't like that they, they didn't like that that I had gotten there not because I was um, senior enough but because I had just got lucky and and they put me there and, and so a lot of the people who were trying to transfer into that group, and this group was really, so when a car would come offline, if there was a problem, uh, you would have to kind of figure out how, to, how do I fix that problem or what do I take care of? It could be a, um, you know, a, a scratch or a, a something, you know, something's broken or anything that you think about wrong with a car. And so, and so I was blessed to be there. And, and, and a lot of the guys that I work with, they, they had, it took them a long time to get in there. And they, they, they was really... Um, and so they, they held me in disdain, a, a lot of the guys. They were really kind of bad people, hard to be around. I didn't like, and so, and so day in and day out, I had a, a much better job, but the people that I worked with were so hard to be around. And it was, it was really a, a rough couple years because I, I didn't like those, those people. And, and, and it got to the point where um, that was all I could think about was, oh, I got to go back to work. And I, not because I didn't like my job. The job itself was, was, was way better than what I'd been doing when I was just on the assembly line. But it was the people. And so, and so for a couple of years, my, my only thoughts almost, it seems like, was, was around this struggle day to day dealing with these people that I, that I couldn't stand. And, and I know, I feel like at least, that it, was, that it caused me um, discomfort personally. It caused discomfort for my family, I believe. And I, and I know that it, that it caused sort of a, a disconnect in my relationship between me and God because all I could focus on, all I could think about, all I could see was my problem, that I had to go deal with these people. And, and I know that all of us go through some of those types of things, or some kind of suffering or struggling from, from time to time. Uh, for the disciples, they were, they were struggling and suffering with the idea that the Christ must suffer and die. And we all have our issues, right? But what we've got to remember is that during those times, whatever our issue is, whether it's at, at work like mine or, or financially or, or whatever our issue is, what we have to remember is that Jesus is the radiance of God. He is God in all His glory. And if we could just see beyond our struggles, we'd see that glory not only is for Jesus, but it awaits us too. Now, maybe not here in this life. God doesn't promise us a, a, a carefree life where we just go uh, skipping through flowers, whistling the songs of happiness every single day. God doesn't promise us that. I don't know why that came to my mind. I don't know why anybody would think that's necessarily happy, right? God doesn't promise that we'll never have financial problems. God doesn't promise that we'll never have relationship problems. God doesn't promise that, that when, when you have these, these moments for the families come over for the holidays, that your uncle's not going to be weird. God doesn't promise any of those things. But what he does promise is that he'll be there. And that the glory of, of him is in Christ because Christ is God. And that because Christ is in glory, then glory awaits us as well. And so with Jesus and, 
with Jesus there on that mountain is Moses and Elijah and Mark being succinct here in Mark chapter 9 as usual. It doesn't say much about what's going on there, but I want to look at Luke chapter 9 verses 30 and 31 because Luke does. He says this. He says, And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And so here we have Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and they're talking about Jesus' departure, which was going to be coming up here in about nine months or so from, from this moment on the mountain. And all of that's fine, I guess, to us. That, you know, great, they're talking about Jesus' departure. We don't really see the tie-in. But the Greek word here... That, 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 you, that Luke, Luke uses here in, in, as he writes his letter, the Greek word that they translate departure is actually the word exodus. And so Moses, who led an exodus out of Egypt, is talking to Jesus about his exodus. Where, where in the minds of the disciples, those who are there, they, they know this, they would, have, they would have read, they would have heard this. James, Peter, Peter, James, and John who were there, or later on when they we read Luke's letter, they would automatically, the minds of these Jewish disciples would automatically go to Moses who led this, this incredible exodus out of slavery, liberating the Hebrew people from Egypt by the blood of the Passover lamb. Remember the story, right, as... as as, the, the, as, as God is about to do this final plague on the people to save themselves, what they have to do is they have to take the perfect lamb and they, they put it on the doorpost, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost so that this, this lamb, so that the, the angel will pass over them so that they will be saved. And like Moses, Jesus will liberate a people through the blood of a lamb. But not just any lamb, a spotless Lamb of God. He himself will fulfill Passover forever by becoming the Lamb and leading a new nation. Not the nation of Israel, but the nation of kingdom and priests, the nation of God. And Peter, in his usual way, Peter speaks up. Look at Mark chapter 9, verses 5 through 8. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say. And they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. So here they're standing there. They see the radiance of God beaming through Christ. They know that Moses is dead, but he's there. Elijah's dead. We don't understand it, but dead, but he's, he's there. We don't get this. It's, it's beyond our comprehension. But here is the three kind of main key pillars of, 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 of all of the Old Testament, of all of the people of God. And, and yet here God is, or Jesus is, is radiating this, this glory. And there's sort of this awkward silence and they don't know what to say. I don't like awkward silence either, right? Sometimes I speak up. Well, Peter speaks up. And he makes a weird suggestion. Usually when you, when you say something because you, you know, there's an awkward silence, you feel like you've got to fill the space with some words, you end up saying something dumb. I, trust me, I know, I, I do it a lot. It comes across as weird, and this time it's no different. Peter says, Let's, i got an idea. Let's throw up some tents. Right here, here we got Moses and Elijah been dead for a thousand years. And then he's like, i got an idea, let's, let's throw up some tents. But Peter's idea really isn't as weird as it sounds to us. It, it's translated tense there, but it's the same word that they used for tabernacle. And like in the Old Testament, when Moses led the people and they were wandering, they had the tabernacle, which, which, which got filled with his presence, came down from the mountain, built the tabernacle in the presence of God that was, was in the tabernacle. And so Peter's basically saying, this is so incredible. This is amazing. This is, this, is a, this is a worshipful experience. This is an experience full of, of wonder and awe. So we need to set this moment aside. We need to set this place aside. We need to set up a, a religious site. It's a way for them that they could recognize that this was special, that this was amazing. And while Peter's are in, intentions are good here, it was a bad suggestion. He wanted to stay there. He wanted to worship to continue there in that place and on that mountain. If Peter's suggestion had, had followed through, it would have hindered God's plan. Peter wanted to hang out there, worship there, hang out on the mountaintop. This experience was amazing. You've heard of mountaintop experiences. This is exactly what Peter was having. And he wanted to stall it. He wanted to make it last. He wanted to, to keep having that mountaintop experience. But if that had happened, God's plan wouldn't have continued. 
And yet here is another ex- example of Peter who likes opening his mouth being rebuked by God. Remember just last week we, we talked about him being rebuked by Jesus calling him Satan. This time he wasn't rebuked by Jesus calling him Satan. He was rebuked, rebuked by a voice from the cloud and the voice said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. It's not getting behind me, Satan. I mean, that's as bad as it gets, but it's pretty close. It's more like, be quiet, Peter. Just be quiet and do what Jesus says. Peter wanted to hold on to that moment to keep, keep that mountaintop experience to stay there, but that wasn't God's plan. And if they had stayed, it wouldn't have moved the mission forward. And sometimes, as Christians, we struggle with this. You know, we don't think about it like that. We remember the mountaintops. We remember those moments in church when things were just right or that moment, you know, we, that song, that one special song that we have that takes us to the mountaintop and we want to we stay right there. We remember that time when the, when the church was flowing, over, was flourishing and overflowing with people. We had to bring out extra chairs. There were so many people. If we could just bring people back to that mountaintop experience, have the, the same kind of music or that same kind of moment, well, then, then the, the place would be like that again and we want to keep going back. I, I preached at a little church in northern Kentucky Kentucky, uh, almost a couple years. It was called Sardis, and, and it was a, a dying church. It, and and um, it was full of. It was not full, but there was the people that were there were great people. Uh, they were older, and, and they had kind of grown up in that church, and they loved that church. And that that community used to be a, a, a flourishing community of farmers, and, and a lot of them had, were dying off. And the the there was the they were the their kids were selling the property to other people, and it wasn't really a, a farm community anymore. It was just kind of a uh, you know, people were moving away from there. And so when I was there, one of the older guys uh, that was an elder, um, it was exciting because they had gone for a long time without having anybody every single week. And so I, I would just show up on Sundays and, and preach. It was a great experience for me and it was good for them. And he said, this is, this is good, this is good. This is kind of like the, the way things used to be. Let's have a revival. And he was remembering in the 60s and 70s and maybe even in the 80s when revivals were great and people would show up. He said, let's have a revival. And I said, if that's what you want to do, I'll, I'll be here. And so we planned this three-night revival. And, and it, was like, it was like the people, the 25 people who were there on Sunday morning and maybe a couple others who go to church down the road. He remembered it differently. And I think as Christians, we do that too. And we want to go back to those mountaintop experiences. We want to, we want to hold on to the way things are. We want, to, we, want to, we want things to be the way they, they used to be. And sometimes when we do that, we hold back the mission, like Peter. Keep it from moving forward. We can do this in a million different ways, but styles or music or, or whatever. There's a million things in which we can do that. And as they looked up, they saw Moses and Elijah were gone. Peter had this suggestion, let's build some tents, let's hang out here, we'll stay here forever. And they look up and Moses and Elijah are gone. The message could not be any clearer to to Peter and James and John. Gone are the days when when Moses and, and Elijah are elevated to first place. From this point forward, Jesus is the authority. From this point forward, Jesus is the mission. From this point forward, you must listen to him. And this ended up being something Peter never forgot. Several years later, when he wrote his letters, he used this as evidence. Second Peter, uh, chapter, is Second Peter chapter one, verses sixteen through eighteen. He he writes, "For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of His majesty." For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter experienced the glory of God. And the glory they experienced on that mountain was simply a taste. It was a foreshadowing of what's to come. And the same is true for us. We can experience the glory of God by reading His Word, by seeing and understanding what Jesus did, but it's a a foretaste of of what's to come when we all get to experience God's embrace forever and ever. And no wonder Peter wanted to set up camp there, right? Can you imagine being in the presence of God, just seeing the glory of God? That is a mountaintop experience. But they had to move on. They had to come down from the mountain. Look at Verses 9 through 13. 
And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why did the scribes say first that Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it was written of him. So Jesus tells them to be quiet about this. We don't really get this. That doesn't make sense to us, right? You know, why, why, why keep quiet about this? I wouldn't have been able to. I'd have had my phone out taking pictures. I'd have had that thing all over social media if I saw the radiance of Christ there on the mountain. I'd have been telling everybody. I like to tell stuff. My kids tell me I tell too much. I'm sure Peter wanted to, to, to tell, right? He's got a big mouth like me. He wanted to tell. But seeing the, the glory of Jesus, the radiance of God, is it something you want to tell about? But Jesus told them not to. And they were getting a glimpse of what was to come in the resurrection. He wanted them to be quiet because who would have really believed them anyway? But after the resurrection, after Christ dies and rises to new life, they will know that's true. When someone dies and and, and rises to life again, um, anything can be true, right? The radiance of God, that's no big deal after you die and rise to new life. And so they have this discussion about Elijah and Elijah to come. And, and basically what, what Jesus is telling them that, look, the suffering is going to be a part of this. And um, I'm going to skip, Sean, this, this, these verses in, in Matthew. But basically what he was telling him is, that, look, Elijah was, was John the Baptist. And, and he did come. John the Baptist was him. So, so they must have thought that, look, Elijah's here. Elijah's here. So we, the, this, this whole suffering talk can end because Elijah's here. They knew that Elijah had to come before the Christ would come. They'd been on the mountain, and on the mountain they saw the glory of God, Jesus in his radiance shining like the sun. And so they thought this suffering talk would end, but Jesus said, no, just as he suffered, I'll suffer. And we have to remember that this applies to us. It's not just a moment on a mountain. It's not just something that we can read in Mark chapter 9 and kind of think about that thing that happened that one time. It applies to us. And the way for us to survive in this world filled with suffering is to worship. If if we want to survive in this world, when you watch the news, all you see is suffering, is to go to the mountaintop and worship. We must maintain our focus on that mountain. We must remember that, that through that even though there are valleys all around us, Christ is still shining the radiance of God. And and the radiance of God didn't just shine that one time on that mountaintop experience. No, the radiance of God shines through Christ and in Christ for all eternity. And for us to make it, for us to endure in this world filled with suffering and heartache, we must remember that Jesus is still shining in His glory. And these men of God were were being prepared for tests that they, they had no idea was about to come their way. They had no idea that, that they were being prepared for service in the kingdom of God. And that, that that service in the kingdom of God, to serve in the kingdom of God, they needed to be prepared. And they were prepared by seeing the glory of God here in Jesus. And their, their, their service in the kingdom of God would eventually lead to their punishment and their death. But seeing the radiance of Jesus strengthen them for what was to come. And maybe you've had a similar experience. Maybe you've seen the radiance of God through someone's compassionate heart during a rough patch in your life that helped you through. Maybe you've struggled with fear and you've seen the radiance of God through someone's encouragement. They shined the radiance of God into your life and gave you strength. Wouldn't it be good... Wouldn't it be amazing if we were able to tap into the radiance of God whenever we were feeling down or depressed or struggling, whenever our life was hard, whenever we went to work every single day thinking, I just wish this day would hurry up and be over, whenever we had financial problems or or relationship problems or whenever our weird uncle comes over and does that thing. Wouldn't it be good if we could just tap into the radiance of God wherever we were and whenever we were to help us get through? I got good news for you. There is a way. And it's worship. See, in your worship, 
you have access to the glory of God. In your worship, you have access to the radiance of God in your life. Wherever you are, day or night, in worship, you can, like, just like Peter and James and John, experience the radiance of Christ. The, the transfiguration of Jesus on that mountain was an experience of worship for them, and it gave them the courage to continue to move forward, and worship can do the same for us. When we talk about worship, we usually think about coming in here on Sunday mornings and we sing some songs, and, and that's worship, and, 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 it, and that is, it is that. But that's not all worship is. And worship is, is thinking about and expressing the remarkableness of God, that, that He is altogether different than us. And when we think about how truly awesome God is, how magnificent God is, how wonderful God is, and we begin to express that. That's worship. And we can do that with others in a setting like this, and I, I encourage it if you're not uh, normally a churchgoer to find either stay here or go somewhere else where this is the case. But we don't have to do it in a group like this, as the, though that's part of it. We can also worship alone. But worship is, is simply seeing and expressing God's worthiness. It's seeing and expressing the goodness and, and majesty and holiness of God. And so when we sing songs here, try to imagine them as you singing directly to God to honor Him, or you're singing to, about God to someone else about uh, who He is or what He's about, or in your, in your worship times that are private. As you read Scripture, praise Him for what you've read or what you've learned or what you've understood about Him. Ascribe to Him the glory that is worth. And when we do that, we have those mountaintop experiences. Then the glory of God, the radiance of Christ, is able to fill us up and help us get through and live out the mission for Him. Several years ago, I read a little book. If, you don't, um, if you're on Amazon, you can check it out. It's probably there. It's called The Way of a Worshiper. It's, it's it's, it's very easy to read, very small. But it made me think differently about worship. Um, my thought, like probably a lot of yours, was, was that you would, you know, worship was something you did on Sunday morning. But, but, but I learned it's different than that. It's more than that. And if we could begin worshiping God all the time, we would, we would see God in His radiance and draw encouragement to hold on until He comes again, until we can be face to face with Him. But in this case, we won't be face to face with him like Moses where, where God has to cover our face so that we don't see him only seeing his back. No, no, we get to experience the fullness of God, the fullness of God's glory. In Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4, it reads this. No longer will there be anything accursed. He's talking about the end. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb, of God, and the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see His face and His name will be on their forehead. For all of us who worship God through Christ, who have been saved through Jesus, there will be a time when He comes again and we get to be with Him and we'll see Him face to face for who He is. Suffering and pain will be gone. Struggles that we deal with will be gone. But until then, let's worship so that we can make it. In a moment, we're going to sing a song, and, and I'm going to pray. And it's a, We call this our time of invitation. It's really just a time for you to reflect on, on those things, on the Word of God here uh, um, as He spoke through me. And I just pray that uh, you'll use this time to reflect on your life and the radiance of Christ in your life. If you're not a Christian, I would love to talk to you. I'll be standing right here. If you have any other issues that you want to talk about, I'll, I'll be right here during this song. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for Jesus. Father, thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for, for giving us the examples of, of Jesus in, in your word that we, can, that we can see and understand. God, I, I, I am so thankful. There have been moments in my life where I've felt like Peter. I've been on the mountain in worship. God, I pray that you would help me continue that, that kind of worship in my own life. I pray that for the people that are here as well, that our worship leads us to those mountaintop experiences that can endure us till the end. God, help us to be strong and to stay strong. Looking forward to that time when Jesus comes again. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing.
Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll go.